No, no. It looked like uh, you know the old school like braces. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. With the, the like wire in front of the chin. Yeah, that's Before what it looked like. Better at the back, then you can sort of get by. We can make this work. <sighs> yeah. Well, we're burning daylight. It, like yeah, we by the end it. of this, it's going to be black. <laughs> oh, that looks a lot better. You yeah, look, you kind of look like an Amish guy that's on the podcast. That's not <laughs> sure if he's supposed to be doing this or not. Yeah. <laughs> Do they have Amish people in Australia? No, no. Amish really down there. Really, no. that's odd because we have them everywhere. I know. Here. I've seen a lot. They're of what keeps our country on the straight and narrow. They were, I think it's what builds all the barns. <laughs> I thought you were going to say the bars. <laughs> bars. No. I wonder if anyone's ever hired them to build a bar. I grew up in kind of a fundamentalist group, and they—I mean—they built a bunch of bars. We didn't yeah. drink though, so. Yeah, right. It's good work, good works, good work. So I guess, Chris, you just flew all the way up here to hang out with us, right, and do this podcast? That's exactly right. How is that flight? Are we recording? We are. All right, sick. Just a small 22-hour flight. <laughs> Wasn't too bad. Wait, so 22 hours, What from where to where? Uh, flew out of Brisbane to LAX. I got layover, actually, in LAX. Got stuck there for a night because of all the storms in uh, Fort Worth. And then you know, I flew to Fort Worth by the same my pants, got there for the night, and there was another storm, so I couldn't get out that night and delayed my travels up here. Yeah. So did you stay in the airport, or were you, like, in a hotel? No, I tried to stay in the airport, but I got a hotel, luckily, one night. But, yeah, just found a hotel, made it work. Okay. Yeah. That's good. Wow. Yeah. When you're flying that far, are you doing economy, or? Yeah, I'm just I'm just cattle class. Yeah. <laughs> I'm down the back. I'm not too worried. How is that? What kind of folks are flying to the states just your regular or is there kind of a particular crowd a lot of americans coming back from oz actually yeah. yeah they're all coming back been on vacation over there uh yeah a few aussies coming over here looking around yeah just people doing their thing <laughs> they didn't they didn't mind me i was wearing my cowboy boots and my hat poking around i didn't want to get my hat crushed yeah wherever i want to put it i thought i'd look like a bit of a silly bugger but anyway i got by oh man when i so when i flew here this is the first time <laughs> i've ever done this like i've you know, like I flew out here last year. Yeah, yeah. And same deal, like wear your hat on the plane or whatever. But but this year I was like, I, but I'm going to be comfortable. So I was in like sneakers, sweatpants, T-shirt, <laughs> and my felt hat. And yeah. that's what I like walked through the airport with. That's a look. Yeah. yeah People probably was. think you're on your way back from vacation, just picked it up. Well, talk about Goofy. Remember when I flew out of Vegas and I bought that hat? And I think I had... Oh I had yeah, two. you had to. Put I wore a two hat. home on my head. He he, like the whole <laughs> way home, just put the other hat on his hat yeah. back from the NFR. Yeah, yeah, no, it's funny. I I had the I had the denim jeans and the button down. That's all I wore, and everyone's just looking at me like, "Who the heck are you? Where'd you come from?" <laughs> yeah, straight out of the bush. But they um yeah, I, I even felt I felt weirder in a, in America than I did in Australia. Actually, I rocked up here and there was people wearing pajamas and all sorts of things in the airport, and I was oh. like, "Strange people." Bro, here. Americans do not and give I, a crap about I, air travel. And I was really worried, actually. I got to Billings there, and I'm um, never driven on the right-hand side of the road, or well, the wrong side of the road in my mind, because in Australia we drive on the left. Yeah. Yeah. Got it, Got out of the airport there and was heading down that uh, I-90 or whatever, just coming down here to Sheridan, and uh, missed my turn off and ended up in the main main street of Billings, and I was I was a bit worried. <laughs> I was going to get western. Yeah. Yeah, but I Yeah, because Billings through. is, like, not normal traffic patterns, Period. No, like, I, the, yeah. whatever side of the road you drive on. I convinced everyone that it was just a tiny little country town. They're like, there's like 110,000 people or something. I'm like, I didn't know that. Thank you for that information. <laughs> <laughs> but I got out of there and I was like, thank God for these interstate freeways. I had to go. So, yeah. yeah. And I, the funny thing, I saw some roadkill. I thought, oh, they got kangaroos here as well, like Australia. Yeah. You would have seen them over there. And oh, I was like, yeah. there's kangaroos here. And I thought, actually, that's probably not a <laughs> roo. Yeah. 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 When I was over there, um, yeah. There were definitely a lot of de dead roos, but um, there are a lot of wombats too. Yeah, yeah, down, a lot of down, wombats in that country. Down where I was. So, funny thing about like driving on the opposite side of the road, we were talking earlier. Uh, I had a buddy. Uh, we went uh, down. He was from like the Tumbarumba mm, area. Yeah. So, that's like snowy mountains, all that deal. Um, kind of like where I'm from. It's like mountains, curvy roads, not a straight road, not a flat road anywhere, right? And... We go down for the weekend from uni. He's got an extra horse. We both, like, compete in the draft, get to, like, experience all that. Great. And he's like, hey, I'm trying to, like, bring my truck back. You think you can help me bring my truck back? Yeah. And I was like, yeah, absolutely, man. No problem. Because, you know, I was allowed to drive over there and everything. 
And he was like, okay, uh, just one thing. It's a manual. And I was like, dude, I'm like, I'm a ranch kid. Like, I drove manual. And I get in it, and I realize I'm on, like, the wrong side. And I've got to shift <laughs> with my left hand. Left and I'm hand. like, oh. But but you still put the clutch in yeah. with your left foot. So it's, like, half what I'm used to. <laughs> and then I got to shift. And yeah. right, and then I'm in, like, just the middle. Just do it like this. <laughs> yeah. but And I'm in the middle of the snowy mountains, right? Like, there's no like oh well I'll just get it in fourth and just go or no. whatever it is. It's like shifting all, all the time. time. All oh the time. Oh my gosh! Yeah. I was like, I was like, please do not let me ruin this man's transmission because yeah. he was driving the other truck with the float back, right? Yeah. So yep. it was like, well, you definitely need to drive the horses back. That's it. But like, please don't make me ruin this <laughs> man's transmission. <Ooh. laughs> yeah. But I got it figured. Like, it was like a three-hour drive, and about two hours in, like I wasn't grinding gears anymore. Mm. So. Yeah, I, <laughs> two hours I, in. I had I had some time in the in that snowy mountain country in Victoria of Australia, um, up with the video like the Mount River is with that festival and all that. Absolutely. And um, in my country, it's just dead pan flat. You drive for two hours straight, don't stop, and like just put the hammer down. Yeah. In that country, you drive ten meters and you got to turn hard. Like you're just so like snake trail the whole way and gear yeah. changes. Oh, it drives me insane. I want a manual in that country, but yeah, yeah, when you're towing, you want. In those utes and those trucks over there, you want manual and you want to, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, so that um, that area, like Koryong and that mm. whole deal, yeah. that looks very similar to, like, where I'm from. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, it's nice country down there. Uh, yeah, it, it's fun and just, I don't know what it is. I, I, I guess it's in, like, a lot of rural places, but especially down there, it's, like, everyone you meet's a character. Mm. Like, you go to, like, any gas station <laughs> and there's just, like, some old cheap farmer or whatever yeah. who will talk your ear off, like in every gas station. That's right. Like there, it's it's a good group down there for sure. Yeah. So yeah. I, I know you're from Queensland. Mm. Is that like your town or is that your area? That's I don't the, know much that's about the, state. the area. So there's seven okay. states, or so in Australia. And yeah, Queensland's northeast corner, and I'm about ten hours west of Brisbane, which okay. is the main sort of town that in that area. Um, yeah, just on a on a branch out there, and yeah. Pretty good place to be, man. And y'all run sheep and cattle. Yeah, so we run sheep and cattle out there. Actually, we've got an interesting sort of property. Um, we call them stations out there, but yeah, it's a different station. We're um, our station's pretty historic, so it's kind of got a bit of history about it. It was, it, it was put, established in eighteen eighty one. Okay, and it's actually one of the longest running sheep studs in Queensland, or well, it is the longest running sheep stud in Queensland currently, and that's also the largest. So we've got thirty five thousand sheep over there. And we've got about 4,000 head of cattle on that 35,000 sheep? Yeah. That oh. sounds like a fair few, but you'd run about seven or so sheep to a cow. Yeah. But, yeah, no, we've got 35,000 sheep. We've that got just gives me an aneurysm, <laughs> knowing what it <laughs> takes to take care of sheep. <laughs> a lot of work in landmarking those suckers. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so we breed we breed rams for the public. Like, we breed rams for seed stock and that, and um, we breed them a lot for ourselves with our operation because it's so large. But, um, yeah, that, that stud's been going for over 143 years now, and um, mm. my dad was there at the manager for the last 30 years, and I've just taken over the last three years, and it keeps me plenty busy, I can tell you that much. So we've got a pretty good crew there. There's about seven to nine workers at any one time mm. on the ranch, and, yeah, it's it's good fun. The cattle work's my favourite part. Like, I get to get my horses out and get around them and gather them and, yeah, do all the – I try and get all the cattle work done with horses, but all the other stuff, it's all mechanised now. It's all motorbikes. I sure. use dogs, working dogs a lot, yeah. Kelpies? Yeah, i got Kelpies. i got um, I got 12 at the moment. I'd had 16 before I got here, and I sold four before I came over, actually. Oh, okay. Well, that helps finance the trip a little bit, doesn't it? It did a bit, yeah. yeah. I was going to sell a few horses, but i got to get back home and get them trained up and get them moved <laughs> on. <laughs> yeah, yeah typically a, you want them broke before you sell them. That's it. Well, these <laughs> ones are going, they're older geldings and things, but, yeah, I've got I've got a stud of my own, breed a few and train them up, and, yeah, I've got about 22 at the moment. Yeah, hmm. keeps me plenty busy. So do you... Do you breed kelpies or just need that many for that many sheep? No, I breed them. I just breed them, and if I want a pup out of a, a certain dog or a bitch in, in my pack, I just breed them, and then whatever surplus, I'll move on. I'll yeah. sell them as pups, hopefully, and if I can't, I'll keep hold of them and train them up. Either Facebook will move them on or I'll take them to a sale if I end up with them, and they end up really well and like good trained-up dogs in the sale. Yeah. Yeah, no, and there's, there's they're good, like, yeah, all the dogs I try and keep are all good. They have a job and they've got a purpose and they work and, yeah, yeah they make my life so much easier on the sheep and the cattle even. Like just having a good dog in Australia, there's a saying that they're worth two good men on a, on a horse remote. Oh, like they're just yeah. indispensable. When, they got, when they're 
when they're tuned up, they're just like a bridle horse. They're just right there mm-hmm. whenever you need them. And they can read your mind. Like, they literally know their job and where they go. Mm. Yeah. 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 So my, um, I guess maybe the last 10 years or so, my dad's bred Kelpies mm. over here in the States. You know, obviously there's not as many over here. And, and we're definitely not, like, I wouldn't consider us dog people. Like, it's definitely just, like, for the breeding part of it, right? And um, and And they're worth quite a bit because – they're way less common than like border collies and healers yeah. and stuff over here. But, um, yeah, my, my first experience, I, just let me go down the like dog route for a minute. Do it. <laughs> um, and we'll, we'll get this conversation back on track, but I'm curious, like, do you have any, um, you know, obviously you're here at the Colt starting. And so I assume Buck is like a big influence on your horsemanship and stuff. Do you have a guy or, um, anyone who was kind of like a guiding light for you and like handling dogs or like teaching you that or anything? Yeah, I do in a certain way, Joe. There's, um, oh, there's a number of good dogmen over there in Australia. There's plenty of good ones that win the trials and, you know, good people. There's a certain guy at the moment, his name's Neil McDonald. He's running a show in Australia called Master Dogs. So if you can, I'm watching about Kelpies, look up that. But yeah, Master Dogs is a pretty good show. It's run for a couple of seasons. It's all about getting these young pups and training them up till they're a year old and getting yeah. them out and doing a job with them. And, like, um, I've been to – oh, he's like the Buck Brenneman of the horse world, but the yeah. dog man in Australia, he is okay. the duck's nuts. He's pretty good. So over there I've followed him a bit and done a bit with him um, in his, like, clinics. They call them just, you know, do- working dog schools. Yeah. And it's more so about the st- – it's funny because a good, a good dog actually runs off instinct – it's like those horses. They've got that natural self-preservation, but then, you know, you hop on their back. They, you don't teach them how to canter. They know how to canter. They know how to roll back. They know how to transition. You're just doing it and putting a cue to it. So with those dogs, they know how to go around and gather cattle, gather sheep. They know how to work them, and they've got that natural – they can naturally read stock, and they can naturally work stock way better than humans can just because of that predator-prey nature. But this Neil McDonald, he works a lot on getting the humans working their stock well, and when you can work your stock well – and understand how to get on your mob of stock, then your dogs just click and they just work the opposite to you and they just, yeah. it just, it works so much better. It's like, yeah, it's just like, you know, you could hop on a horse and ride the sucker, but it's probably going to buck you down if you don't have any saddle, tack, gear, you know, and you don't have any idea how the horse works and you've got no cues, no constant cues. So if you just get in the right position on those stock, let's say cattle, for example, and you're always working in the lead, your dogs are always on the, on the tail of the mob, they're always working to you, and then you can somehow get a couple of calls and send them left, right, stop, sit, back. Like, you know, as soon as you've got those four basic commands of left, right, stop, and walk up, that's it. Yeah. It's as simple as that. Like, the same with the horsemanship deal. Like, you can, there's a lot of similarities. And I was talking to Mindy Bauer there uh, five years ago down at the Legacy Legends in Fort Worth, in Texas. And Buck was sort of giving her a bit of grief about her dog deal there. But I, I've got a lot of dogs <laughs> and that sort of deal. And I've, I've studied a lot about dogs just as much about horses. But um, yeah, I, I can I can see how it definitely has similarities, and I talked to her about it. And we visited there for a while, and yeah, it's it's a pretty cool deal. Like having having like if you work with livestock, you've got to understand their way of thinking. Mm-hmm. It's like trying to understand another person. Um, you've got to understand how they stock are feeling, why they're doing what they're doing, how they operate. You you can read that situation before it even comes. And you know what's going to happen before it comes. Like, that's what made that Tom Do- Tom Dorrance so good. At it. He knew things were going to happen before they happened. Yeah. And Ray Hunt has that saying, like, do a little bit earlier than doing too much later. You know, you just you can just read when things are going to go hell west and crooked so you can get in, the, get in the position to stop it from happening. And those dogs, they can be, they're right on that. That's just born into them in a good one. Same as a good working horse. Like, it'll get low on a cow and it'll just cut it and you'll just sit there. Makes it a lot easier than getting in there with a spur and pushing that cow, uh, your horse across to get that cow blocked and doing making all the, you're doing all the work. Mm-hmm. If you just drop your hand, that sucker goes to work. It make, makes it easy. Yeah. So yeah, I run a lot of dogs and I breed them and train them. And yeah, they like I don't really train them. I just make set the situation up mm-hmm. and make it work. And that Neil McDonald, he is he is the man for that. He he's um, done a bit of work I think with Temple Grandin. Um, okay. There's a lot of guys over there who bought her over and you know. Did a lot of stuff with um, Bud, um, you know, the Bud Box design. Yeah, Bud, Bud Williams. Williams yeah, yeah, got him over there. They've done a lot of stuff with him. And, like, just the mentality of cattle and how getting get, getting cattle, and they're big into sheep, especially near McDonald. He's down in South Australia. Yeah, so he's a bit of an idol of mine in that sort of sense. He's like the Buck Benner of the dog world in Australia. Yeah. Especially with this TV series because it's come out and it's just gone gangbusters. Like, you wouldn't have thought 
city people to be so excited, but they love seeing them little Kelpie puppies getting grown up and actually doing a job. And oh yeah, it's so cool. Yeah, yeah. Dogs always play. Yeah, dogs always yeah. play. Yeah. Um, I can't remember their name for the life of me, but we we've, we've had a couple of dog trainers. Um, yeah, they're from Missouri. Yeah. Um. It's been a really long day. <laughs> Roger has been We're kicking my a, ass. We're having a, a brain boy. fart over that. Yeah. No, but, that uh, last session with Roger was a bit of a, like, <laughs> look, man, here's me and here's you. We're going to figure this out. But I'm kind of wore out after that. It'll, but anyway, it'll come to us. Um, w- so we've had a couple of uh, American dog trainers, like, on mm-hmm. the podcast, uh, husband and wife based out uh, of Missouri now. But the husband's originally from uh, Scotland. So they're... Um, they're mainly into the, like the border collies and all that stuff. Yep. And, um, just cause that, you know, that's the deal in Scotland. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, but they both made a very similar comment to what you just said. They were like, if we can teach people to read the livestock, mm-hmm. like the dog parts easy. Oh yeah. Right. That, like that's always the problem. People are like, well, I want to get a better handle on my dog cause they're doing this and doing that. And, it, and then you're like, okay, show me. And then it's like, well, the people like can't see what the sheep are yep. thinking or can't position. see what the ca- cattle are thinking or whatever it is. Yeah, exactly. And so it's like, yeah, no wonder there's a lot of friction there because you're always putting the dog in the wrong spot or whatever it is. Yeah, getting them in a jam, it just doesn't yeah. work. And you yeah. got to be, yeah, if you're in the right position, they're in the right position, it makes things, yeah. it just, it's just that little bit of refinement. Mm-hmm. You might, you might only be like, there's a thing uh, that I've learned that if you stare at your dog, it just shuts them down. Yeah, it's like having too much energy near a cult. It just makes them so uneasy; they just can't handle that sort of pressure. Yeah. And you might even know it's happening until you get in that position on them, mm-hmm. and just yeah, it's just experience. It's yeah. I've been talking to a lot of people in this last couple of weeks. I've been in the states about experience and exposure, and how we talk about knowledge. People have so much knowledge, and knowledge comes from experience. It's just mm-hmm. if you're like, I've been really blessed in my life where you know I've been on a ranch, grown up there, and all that sort of gear and deal and. I've just, um, yeah, I've, I've watched stock, you know, basically in the wild or yeah. I've, I've worked that many stock that many times that I'm no expert by any means, but I've got a hell of a lot of experience with sheep and cattle yeah. in, in, you know, in Australia. Yeah. And that, and I've only had working dogs for the last 10 years since after college, I got a dog and just built up from there and gone with it. And I've seen how they've become such an asset, especially the good ones. Like you can get some, some sort of dink ones. They're just, yeah. they're just no, no good. They sort of, they're okay. Good for them a house pet sort of deal but yeah yeah you get some good working dogs and they're just they're indispensable you can you take them suckers to the vet when they get hurt and you treat them like family they are yeah 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 absolutely well and not that i have a ton of experience but just from what i have seen um you mentioned you know like like horses you can like if you just have horses Mm -hmm. and you're working cattle you can still get a lot done you can still get everything done Right. Um, but like if you've got, especially the volume of sheep you're talking about and you've got a good dog, holy crap, it's worth its weight in gold. Mm. Because I like from what I've seen, dogs can have such a huge impact on like how the day of like working a set of sheep is going to go compared to cattle where it's like if we have the dog, great, it's going to go good. But if we don't have the dog and we've got like good hands horseback, we'll still get it done either way Mm. but the sheep are like once you get over a certain amount of sheep like you have to have a dog of some sort it seems like to me but yeah i don't know if you have thoughts on that but that's been my (laughs) experience you know that's that's true i yeah there's there's a lot of uh talking from australian australian experience here but there's a lot of uh things within the like sheep industry where you have paddock dogs and your yard dogs Oh, and really? if you're if you're working in the out in the pasture and you bring sheep into the into the yards, um, yeah, you can use these dogs and they work wider and they're more of a herding dog and they'll bring them in, stay off them and bring them in nice in a group and bunch them up. And then when you get to the yards, you have your harder, stronger dogs that like working in in the nitty gritty and close and they might bite them, they might back and bark or they jump across their backs up and down the race and things, and they are worth their weight and gold because. Apart from opening gates, they can do about just about anything else. They can yeah. get those sheep up to you and send them back and forwards all day, and they just love it. And like, like I was visiting with you there before about dogs, like they just want a bit of water and a, and food and just a pat at the end of the day. And they're the cheapest workers that you'll ever have. They'll never <laughs> complain. They're just happy to have a day's work. They're good. Yeah, and they're like, yeah, with that with that yard work with sheep, they can really 
they can be good for you. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Save you a lot of mental stress. <laughs> yeah, I've got zero sheep experience, but I can't imagine there's any other way to work sheep. Yeah, well, they're small. They're, it's sort of a funny deal. You can sort of throw sheep around a bit if they're naughty, but when you've got a couple of thousand, it's a bit of a bit of a gym session, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like, yeah. you know, at the landmarking. Um, but, yeah, yeah, no, no, it's, it's very job. different with cattle. Like, cattle can kill you. They'll get you down. Like, you can you can definitely end up in a wreck with cattle. But, um, yeah, having a good dog that'll turn that, that mentality of cattle around where they want to run away and be in a flight mode where you can get them blocked up, get them, you know, held up, and then you can push them in a certain direction and get them, get them going where you change their minds from fleeing into submission, submission basically. That, yeah, it's really good for that sort of deal too. Like, you can do it on horseback. You can, in Australia, we use four-wheelers and buggies and things like that. But, um, yeah, definitely can change that mental attitude of those stock, and that just makes it so much easier. And, and like I said before... Dogs have a certain um, influence on stock that people just don't have. Like we're humans, we're not. We we are a prey animal with our eyes in front of our face, but we don't go around hunting sheep. They think those dogs are wolves from way back in the day, and they just look at those dogs and go, "We're going to get the hell out of here." Like they move a lot better. The dogs work a lot better. They're lower to the ground. They mm-hmm. stalk them. They yeah, it's just it's all in the way it works. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and just the the agility right yeah like they're oh, way sure. oh so like, much faster si- like laterally they're going to be way better than you on foot or a guy on a bike or or even a horse really yeah and like when you're dealing with sheep that's yeah. such a asset i think they've tracked some dogs in australia there's a couple of um oh, not really competitions but things they are really competitions they are and they, they track these dogs every day for a month and they'll see how far they travel and these dogs are doing 30 k's in a day which is about 20 mile or so they're doing yeah. that far in a day just working. Wow. They're just running and just oh. running and running. They're well, fit as... I do know this. Hungry. It is hard to get to the bottom of a Kelpie. Yeah. No, they work it themselves is. to death. Like, if you don't look after no. them, they'll work themselves literally to death. Did we lose our video? I don't know. <laughs> we may have. We may have. Let's act like we haven't, because we might not have. All right. I'll look. Okay. Always something. No, I think we're good. Yeah, are we back? Did we lose it? No, we're still there. Okay, sweet. No, it, it's still going. Sweet. Oh. Just getting a close up of you there, Ben. Yeah, get in there for the beauty shot. Um, hey, speaking of sheep, is it true that Australia stockpiles massive amounts of wool, and they kind of dole it out so it helps keep the price even? <laughs> is that true? <laughs> they used to do that back in the day a bit, but no, not anymore. We just. We just shear our sheep now and we just send it straight to market. And if the price is good, you'll sell it. If it's not good, you might hold it for a... It's, it's a funny sort of product where it'll store for a long time. It can store for, a, you know, up to years even, like easily. Um, but, yeah, if you get a good price, you just take that price. Or if you want to hold on to it, you can. You just pay storage fees. But, yeah, no, don't don't really do what you're saying in stockpiling anymore. That was okay. way yeah. back in the day. Like, you personally, what do you enjoy about sheep? Because I know back in the day here in America, you had the sheep versus the cowboys. And yeah. I don't know. Like, a as a kid, I always thought sheep, I, I mean, I still, I wouldn't buy sheep, I guess, is what I'm saying. <laughs> bit of adversity So I'm just there. wondering, like, is like, it a business move? Is it fun? Is it heritage? I don't know. It's heritage, basically. Where my family's grown up, I'm like fifth, sixth generation, actually, now. Um, and, yeah, like, we've just, we've been there since the inception of that, that station. And it's got 143 years of history in the family. And it's just, it's, we just trying to keep that rolling on um but yeah as far as the sheep go it, it's a it was a it was a traditional thing in australia it rode on the sheep's back back in i think about the 50s and they were the golden eras when you know wool was worth a pound for a pound um nowadays wool's probably not as profitable as it could be it has been really profitable in the past you know ebb and flows like everything else the you guys need to start market. stockpiling that again well you could yeah <laughs> anyway so yeah with the sheep there they make more money in our country like just the land type and where yeah. we are sheep are more traditional and they make more money in that area it's not really the best cattle country it's funny our area there we grow a very large bulk of feed and then we hammer that down through the winter months and then it'll come back again next spring summer but yeah, those sheep, they do really well in that country where it mightn't rain. It might be just a short amount of green pick. The grass just comes up slightly and cattle just won't do well if it if there's not that rain there. So it's it's mainly history for a start. Then it's monetarily better than cattle in our, in our land type. Um, and yeah, just heritage. And 
I do enjoy sheep work. I love sheep work with the dogs, and just it's just good fun. It's just it's just small fuzzy cows. <laughs> but yeah, I do I do enjoy my cattle work on the ranch back home. Like I really enjoy getting around cows. And like when I finished school, I went up to the Northern Territory, which is like the wild west of Australia, um, untamed sort of land. I was on ranches up there, over a million acres. There was one I was on recently that was two point two million acres, ran about fifty thousand cows. You know. Just, yeah, massive amount of cattle. You just can't understand that landscape and how big it is. Um, but there was uh, the main reason I'm up there was to ride horses. I just wanted to get on horse, horseback and just, you know, just trail cattle. And that was a great place to do it. They were paying pretty good money back then. Like, it wasn't wasn't brilliant money, but it was it paid the way. And, you know, I just wanted that experience. So I went up there and went ringing for a year in the in Northern Territory of Australia. And, yeah, it was just it was some of the best years of my life. Like, the people I met and... We were all just young young people, got together and had a really good time and made a real real good time with the whole deal. Like it wasn't just – it was hard work because us Aussies, we, we pride ourselves in that hard work sort of deal. If there's a hard way of doing it, we'll probably try it out. <laughs> but, um, yeah, we get together at the end of the day, have a few cold beers and just enjoy it and just, yeah, just really the camaraderie was just there. And, like, I've just been doing some branding it here at the OW Ranch and, like, the camaraderie there was just like it was back then when I was – working on those stations it was just all the young, all the people together and just had a good time and we we're pretty funny us Australians we like taking the piss out of each other and a bit of a larrikin sort of spirit where we'd pay each other out a fair bit but these guys here they were just so supportive if you missed a shot roping or you know your horse bucked you down or something silly happened you know you'd, you'd get a pretty good pat on the back you'd, they'd have a bit of fun with you later on but yeah it was all heartless and, you know, yeah, yeah yeah I remember when I met you in Fort Worth at, yeah I think that was 2019 it was 2019 um, March I was asking you about horsemen in Australia because in my mind I had, you know, I had seen Man from Snowy River. I had seen. What's it, uh, Jim Craig? Yeah. Like yeah, everyone's Jim, Jim Craig, right? Tom Billinson, that's it. Yeah. There's the, uh, and then there's, you know, there was other movies like that movie with Hugh Jackman, Australia. Yeah. Australia. You know, you see all these Australian movies. <laughs> and so I was asking you, I was like, is everybody like a great horseman, you know, riding, you know, going for it, cracking their whips and stuff? Everyone's and you were clancy. like, no, not really. You're like, everyone gets on and they just lean way back. And they just ride like hell and hold on. You're like, it's kind of barbaric, really. Yeah. So I'm just curious, um, you know, just as far as your perspective on horsemanship down there, and then also how you got involved in the whole horsemanship deal. Um, what what got you interested in that? Yeah, well, my my dad used to be a jockey um, in his earlier days. He used to ride ride horses out in those western ranches, and like he'd. They all used horses on the ranches, but they used to have these things called grass-fed race days. They'd go into a local town and they'd do a grass-fed race. So he rode in them, so he was always around horses and they used them as a tool. It wasn't really like a, yeah, it was just a tool on the ranches sort of deal out there. Um, but yeah, th- there's there's some really good clinicians in Australia. There's a few few guys over there that know Buck Bradman real well and, you know, that they follow some Americans, that, whether it's cutting, cow horse training. Um, yeah, they're just, they're everywhere really. Um, I've never really dappled too much in the circles of dressage and that sort of deal, like show jumping and whatnot, but I'm sure there's definitely heaps of good clinicians out there in Australia for that sort of deal too. Um, just where I'm from, it's mainly camp drafting is the main sport. Um, some polo cross. What's, what's camp drafting? Camp drafting is, um... I'll answer that in two parts. Okay. So back, back in the early days of Australia when they first introduced cattle, because everything had to come by ship, um, they were all quiet, and then they turned them out, and they got a bit. Some got loose and got a bit wild. Then they took these cattle up to these ranches up north when they started settling Australia, and they had to corral them basically to get them to market. So when they had these calves being born, and they were some big suckers. They weren't just these little baby two week, three week old calves. They were they were some six hundred pound weight yearlings. Like they had a bit <laughs> of weight on them. They were they were Mickey bulls, what we call them. Anyway, so they'd, they'd rope, they'd get them in this corral, just a wire square yard. And they had this uh, this panel, it's called, and it's just these posts that come up to a ridge and it's got a big stay post, like for a snub for a horse sort of deal. And they'd throw these ropes, I don't know, they'd be at, they wouldn't be any longer than 30 feet, they'd be 20 feet, probably 25 feet, and they're an inch thick or so, and it's called green hide in Australia. It's, it's treated with salt. When you get a hide, you salt it and then you cut it into strips and twist it. So it's all twisted, not braided riatas. And it's definitely not raw hide, but it's green hide. So they have these ropes and they'd tie them to their girth on their horse and they'd have the girth then attached, or like the girth point down low below your leg, and they'd have that attached to a pulling collar or a collar around their chest. 
Um, and that's how you drag calves to the fire, basically. You'd rope one out of the mob with the cows and you'd, they'd either hold roe deer or have them in this trap yard. You'd drag them to the panel and that's how you'd brand your calves in Australia. And as they're coming towards the panel yard, um, that panel, you'd run up and you'd throw a leg rope on them. If you didn't get a leg rope on them, when they got to that snubbing post, you'd just throw a leg loop on them and you'd push them into it and then you'd lay them down. And I'm talking, these were some big sucker calves. I kind of want to see a video of yeah, this. Yeah, no, you can look it up. It's called Australian Bronco Branding. It's a pretty interesting sort of deal. They still run a few competitions over there, but it's all wow. died out now. Like I tell people here, when people ask me about roping and that, we just don't do it in Australia. Everything's table branded now. It's all just so much more efficient and effective in our sort of world and the way we work it. Um, but there are still people historically that still do that, like as a historic purpose. But uh, over 100 years ago, that went out of vogue. So talking about cutting cattle out in the in the pasture they used to get these big stations and have you know all these branded calves that had to come to market and back then there wasn't the road trains and transport there was nowadays so in australia you'd get them in a big mob you'd put up a good gather on them and you'd have we call them ringers which are like your cowboys out here in the west um so you'd get your you'd get your crew out there you'd gather all these cattle hold row deer basically and um we call it mobbing up in Australia, and you'd hold them up, and then you'd go in there and cut them out, and you'd have to be a pretty fair horseman, have a good horse to get into this part of the job. Um, it's like being out of brand and getting to being told you told you can get your rope down <laughs> instead of yeah. going to work the ground. So there's people that are holding this road deer. You'd ride in there, and you'd get this big steer out. You know, might be a thousand pound weight, or he might be eight hundred, whatever he is in Australia, between four hundred and six hundred kilos. And you're getting there on your horse, and you push him to the face of the mob. Once he gets to the face of the mob, then you get to cutting on him. And you'd just block him left, right, left, right, whatever it took. If he was pretty subtle, you know, pretty easy going calf, he might just poke out after two or three turns of your horse. And once you've got him blocked and gone out, they used to have to push it in a certain direction to make another mob of cattle. So they have two mobs. They have the one you're cutting out of and the one they're going into. That's all the sales steers. These are all the cows. And they had to hold that road deer. So it's very similar to America. It's, it's kind of funny, the similarities we've had. But... Obviously, yeah, Australian horsemen, different, different saddle, different purposes. We Our saddles are, don't have a horn. They're more of an English-bred saddle with big ears instead of having the uh, knee swells, more or less. I don't know what they call them, but, yeah, those knee swells down there, they'd lift it up to the top of the saddle and we call them ears on the pommel. And then there's, yeah, just the can on the very small saddles. got flaps on not really the um, fenders. But, yeah, so that's what they use, and that's the traditional gear in Australia. And we that's the camp, that's the sport of camp drive, and that's where it came from. These people would go in there, they'd cut these cattle out, and they'd, They'd chase them around and push them into a se certain section. When you're pushing them somewhere, that's called drafting, drafting the cattle. So they called it camp drafting because they called that a camp, a camp of cattle. And then, yeah, it just one a, a while back, I'd know it might have been, uh, I think it was a bit over 50 years ago now, might have been close to 60 or so. But they, they started this sport where they said, you know, my horse is better than yours. I'm a bit more macho, man. You know, let's have a go at this. Let's, yeah, let's yeah. try it out. And now it, the sport's evolved where they have cattle. Instead of being it, held in roe deer, they have a small pen. I don't know. It'd be about, would it be, 30 foot by about 15 foot. Yeah. Um, and they'd get the, they'd get seven head of cattle in there or so, and you'd walk in. You get to choose which beast you wanted to pick out of that mob. And there'd be a judge there on his horse, and he'd have a whip, Australian stock whip. We crack stock whips over there. We don't really use lasso ropes or anything like that anymore so yeah you get your, you get your beast you choose it out you take it to the face of the pen you put a cut on it very similar to, to the cow working sort of deal with that down the fence uh work so you'd get your get your beast blocked up so you can control it in the camp then you'd call for the gates that open these two gates take them out in the course and it's just a big round arena um i don't know it'd be two or three hundred feet across it and there's three like basically trees we plant little trees there so you run around these things in a barrel like a cloverleaf formation yep. and that shows you've got the control of your cattle so you can you can block them in a in a in a certain control environment which is like when they used to push them out of that face of that mob then you'd show your prowess and your skill on that cow with your horse by chasing that cow around there and tracking it around putting control on it in that cloverleaf formation getting it through these last two ones which are called a gate and that's where you'd end up with your mob of cattle so that cow might try and swerve off this way and you'd bend him around a couple of trees and bring him back and then he might go this way and then you put him in that mob and then that's your second mob and they'd take those cattle and they'd walk them from wherever they are in Australia to the east coast, north coast, wherever they're going to ship them out of or kill them. So that's how they used to do it in Australia and that's where the history sort of came from for that sport. Wow. Yeah. It sounds pretty technical. It is pretty cool but it's just, it's just 
yeah. you know, normal ranch work back then. Yeah. That's what they did. That's cool. And I've read a lot of stories in Australia back in the day when they'd walk cattle and it'd take six months to walk them, you know, 3,000 Ks. They'd walk 3,000 Ks <laughs> in six months. And um, I've done a couple of trips, you know, 3,000 Ks. And it's a fairly long drive, let alone walking cattle yeah. at that, you know, 3K an hour sort of deal with you've got cows and calves or 4Ks an hour. If you've got steers, heifers, whatever you've got going. But, yeah, they'd start with these fat cattle. They'd walk them for six months back towards the east coast of Australia from Northern Territory. And there was these big things called stock routes over there where they just big, long stretches of, of trail where they'd have feed and water and you'd be able to make it through there. And then it'd take them three months to ride the horses back. And back in those days, they'd pack saddle them all. So you had all your gear with you. And if you end up running out of water or running out of tucker, you'd be stuck. <laughs> yeah. Golly. Yeah, so that Man. that's sort of how, how that, that sport sort of came about. But as far as you were saying about the horsemanship sort of deal, yeah, no, there's there's definitely some really good horsemen in Australia and they can they can cut a beast with the best of them. Like there's some people that put their hand down those horses and they can turn and burn. Um, the Australian stock horses became came about from a fair mixture of variety of breeds that came into it, mainly thoroughbred and some pony sort of blood. And that bred this really hardy, really strong stock horse that we've got in Australia nowadays. And a lot of the people that camp draft now they breed a lot of quarter horse into their horse. They want that cutting ability, that natural uh, intelligence and trainability that the cutting horses are, are known for. Um, so it's really interesting in Australia. When I came to America five years ago, um, I thought there was only one type of horse, and they were a pretty short squat, you know, cutting horse sort of breed. Was that your first time coming up here? Yeah, back in March. That was my first really? time. Okay. Yep, back in 2019. Then I came here to the Houlihan Ranch later on in June, July. So that was my first sort of two trips in that year. And that was five years ago, so this is my third trip over. But, yeah, no, I just thought there was one type of horse. And then I got here to the ranches, and I saw these big draft crosses that were dragging cars to the fire and stuff. I'm like, there's some big ponies around this country. Yeah. And, like, now I've realised <laughs> there's 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 the sprint bread. There's the, you know, oh, ones yeah. they use for barrels and that. And there's the little the little, <laughs> the little cutters. You know, there's, there's everything. The cow horse ones, there's so many different yeah. like, types within that breed. Same thing in Australia. And it's sort of a sort of, uh, funny thing with the genetic sort of modification, I suppose, nowadays. But yeah, back then they were they were pretty big, upstanding, tall horses in Australia, thoroughbred bred, and yeah. that's what they were for. Yeah, yeah. I I tell people um, who maybe aren't as into like the quarter horse world, mm. it's it's like you have to realize, like in the United States, if you added up all the AQHA registered horses here, and then you also added up like all the warm bloods of like every different type of warm blood or whatever. It's mm. like, there's way more AQHA horses than if you add up every warm blood yeah. breed combined. And there's so much variety, like from warm blood to warm blood breed. It's like, that's, there's that much variety in the AQHA, right? There's like barrel horses and cow horses and foundation horses and roping horses. And like, it's just the, um, the gene pool's gotten so big. Oh yeah, you know that. Like you, even though yes, they're all under one association. Like they're just completely different horses. That's it. Yeah, and like that's where I was going with the story about the different different types of horses in Australia. Now it's just there's so many splintering off effects from the okay. Australian stock horse, and then there's a quarter horse, there's the paint horse association. There's so many different ones, and like our main uh, Australian sort of sports are polo cross, camp drafting. Um, one that's coming about and becoming a bigger thing in Australia is actually the um, the down the fence sort of work and that cow horse work. Mm -hmm. Australians are getting into that, They're, especially in Queensland where I'm from. There's, there's people who are pretty keen because they get out there and they have a go. There's a traditional Australian thing which is called uh, a stockman's challenge, which is where you go out do a dry pattern run, showing your, your, your skill, your horsemanship skills and how your horse can travel, just dry work. Then you put a cow in a camp draft around and you do, you do your cow work with that cow. So that's our traditional sort of Australian sort of standard. But then they, they've got the cow, work, the cow horse work now and you can box that cow, take it down the fence and you show your dry work pattern. Same sort of deal. And people yeah. really can on that. They can, they can show the horses off and it's becoming, yeah, it, it is becoming sort of a similar thing. But people use horses for courses is the saying, isn't it? Mm -hmm. So there's just those different horses for what you want to do. Like you want to get down, cut a beast, probably don't get a really big 17-hand upstanding thoroughbred type thing unless it's really – unless you're real handy good on that sort of deal and you can get it down. But, yeah, you just choose what you want for what you're doing. Mm. Yeah, yeah. That makes sense, though, because, like, when I've described camp drafting to people, I'm like, think about um, cutting and fence work combined. Yeah, yeah. Like, that, that's kind of what it is. So it seems like, you know, if someone 
came over to Australia and was like, hey, this is Rain Cowhorse, <laughs> they'd be like, yeah, sign me up. Let's do it. Yeah. You know? it's. I mean, you just got to change some gear around. But, like, for the most part, the horse, is, the horse flesh is already there to do that sport. Yeah. Yeah. For so, sure. are your horses, do you, like... Do you have quarter horses? You got stock horses? What do you yeah, got like, in your string right now? I got a bit of a mixture in my string. I got some like I've got actual some thoroughbred blood horses. I've got some uh they're just mixed blood horses, a bit of Arab in them, a bit of different stuff. Um yeah, they're just a mixture at the moment. I've got some I've got some straight Australian stock horses, most of mine are Australian stock horses. Then I've got some quarter horses. My stud's actually a quarter horse. Um so yeah, they they keep me pretty busy. Um <laughs> But yeah, I do love the quarter horses for their athleticism and cow workability, and then I do have my my Australian stock horses for the camp drafting and things like that. Yeah, and they're they're pretty cool to ride out. Like they they got a good long trot, they can hit a stride, they can travel a fair way. Yeah, and they're very athletic. They're good. They're hardy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like no, them. those those stock horses are cool. So um, Ben and I both I, I've done way more than Ben, but we've actually played a little polo cross. Yeah, both yeah. Of I. A yeah. Bit. It's a, um, yeah, it's funny, funny sport to lacrosse sort of cross with the horse. It's <laughs> wild, man. It's wild. I yeah. uh, so I I um I was on the polo team in college, so I kind of used polo cross. Um, it, it where I'm at in kind of the mid Atlantic region is probably the biggest spot in the U S for like American polo cross. Not that it's anything like Australia, but yeah, like it's one of those deals where there are like there are a fair few clubs around and stuff. Mm. Um, and yeah, that, that has been one of the coolest things just like kind of dipping the, my toe into that world a little bit is, um, yeah, there's some good stock horse flesh, like mm. in that gene pool, man. Yeah. Like the, like you watch those horses go around and you're like, man, I bet you if you got that thing on a cow, like it could really do some work, you know? Yeah. Yeah. No. That's it. They're all, yeah. They're all bred for their certain disciplines and sports and what they're doing. Like, yeah. It's just what it is, but yeah, the the Australian stock horses are very cowy and they're they're very athletic. They're just a, a very well all rounded horse. I how would how would you describe them? Like if say someone had never been around stock horses, but you know they'd been around quarter horses here. What would you say like the similarities and the differences are? You'd probably have to look it up online, I'd reckon. But the, yeah, Australian <laughs> well, stock horses like, there, just like they're, disposition. They're, they're, they're Do you a, feel like there's they're, a they're disposition a difference? Mm. Yeah, a little bit. They're um, they're they're kind of a bit of a hotter horse because mm. of that thoroughbred blood, I suppose, running blood, and they just they can be really mild or they can be a bit hotter. But I think they they'd run a little bit on the hotter sort of side of things, which is just that athleticism coming out because they're just like a kelpie working dog. They just always want to yeah. get, get do something. <laughs> um, they're they're a, fine, a finer boned animal. They're not so broad in the hip, and especially not you know in the chest. They're a bit of a narrow horse, I'd say. Um, and yeah, they just, they're, they're very well proportioned in the hind quarters up through the hip and everything. And then when you get to the neck, they've usually got a nice swan arch neck. Mm. Um, yeah, no, they're, they're, they're a good all round horse, I believe. And just, yeah, they're very, very vastly different from the stud book quarter horse. Yeah. yeah. Totally mm. different horses. Yep. And yeah, it's a funny sort of deal with them, but yeah, that's just how it is. And like, I've, I've never had much to do with quarter horses until I, um, sort of uh, came into this natural horsemanship thing, which is the deal over here. You know, what I'm actually doing over here, chasing this natural horsemanship uh, influence in my life and what I want to do with horses and where I want to take it. Um, yeah, so my sort of story with the background with how I became, came into the natural horsemanship sort of deal was I was at college and I was doing an ag degree after my two years in the Northern Territory running around Brahman cattle on horseback and I um, always had a passion for horses. I should have been doing the horse course there. Actually, I was more interested in the horse course and I'd, 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 I'd have lunch with the um, old horse breaker he'd come in to have lunch with all of our students at the college um well the university in australia and um I'd, I'd go and talk to him about cowboying days and throwing cattle and mustering cattle and all that sort of stuff and he'd be like i'm i'm starting a cult down here this afternoon and you'd go down there and there'd be all the girls texting and mucking around talking not really listening and i'd be there watching watching him work these cults around mouthing them and whatever he'd be doing i'm like oh cool so i got into that and then um, you know, always had horse and ridden them and that sort of deal. So I um, was pretty keen on the horse sort of side of things, I guess. And then I went into the library one day and found a, a DVD. And um, I think the book I found was a Pat Pirelli book about his sort of horsemanship deal mm-hmm. originally. And then I read that sucker pretty quick. And then I found another couple of horse books. One of them was um, Kel Jeffries in Australia. He developed this method 
kind of similar to the facing up method, but he'd, he'd sort of throw a last rope over a horse and get it facing up to him. Then he'd hop on it bareback with nothing on it and just sort of get it quite gentle enough where he'd handle him on the back of the horse. Pretty cool, pretty cool guy. And then I found this DVD hidden away that's called The Road of the Horse, which is really interesting because I'm... I was like, you know, what's this sort of stuff? And I watched this DVD and it just blew my mind. They were talking about this guy called Ray Hunt and Tom Dorrance and natural horsemanship deal. And I was like, what the heck's that? Anyway, at that stage in my life, I, I met a gal and um, we were sort of partnered up there for a while. And um, her family was really right into the horsemanship deal. And she gave me a lot of good reading, reading material about Ray Hunt and Tom Dorrance. And I went on a bit of an excursion through that sort of trail of where they'd been, what they'd done and... Joe Walter, Brian Newbert, all those top hands and whatever. And I did a lot of study on the natural horsemanship movement because that was all coming in over in Australia just at that stage. And then I found out about Buck Branham and found his DVD and watched that. And I was like, I'm hooked on this. I think this is pretty cool. Yeah. And, um, yeah, from there I was like, yeah, I'll, I want to follow something like that in my life. So, um, yeah, that's sort of where my natural horsemanship sort of spark and aspiration for that sort of style of horsemanship came about from. And then I've just been practising it ever since and just – get my hands on books and DVDs as much as I can because I'm sort of out in the Australian bush there. I can't really get to a clinic or clinician very often. Um, and then, yeah, I was lucky enough um, living on the ranch back at home. I moved back home in uh, April 2014, so that's 10 years ago, just gone. And um, I think it was – I met a guy called Anthony Desiree, and he's a top hand in Australia, and he's a really good horseman. He knows Buck quite well. He's been with this cult out a couple of times, and – He's uh, he's been he actually came to America and rode with Ray Hunt. He was there I think before hey, Ray Hunt dot passed. Yeah, and um, yeah, really good man, good horseman, and um, yeah, he's a bit of a you know an idol in my world. And I got around Anthony Desiree, did a few clinics with him, cult starts, horsemanship, that sort of deal. Then um, heard about Legacy of Legends, went to Tamworth. In I did a cult start with Anthony um, down at his sort of home ranch there. Uh, that was back in 2017, and then in 2018, in January, I went down and did a clinic with Buck doing, um, I think I was in the horsemanship and a roping clinic there at Legacy Legends, and that was really good fun because I'd never really done much roping and had this wade saddle that wasn't really good, wasn't really good for my horse or for me really, but <laughs> I just got this horn, this horn saddle and thought I'd be, you know, go roping onto things. Um, yeah, it, was, it really opened my eyes how much I knew nothing about roping and horsemanship. I was like, I've got to practice a lot more. Um, but yeah, it was just a good thing to be around that sort of deal over there. And then, um, from that, I thought 2019, um, I'd come over to America and yeah, try and get around those guys there in 2019 at Fort Worth where I met you, Ben, and, um, met a lot of good people there, a lot of good hands and just was, yeah, it was just so welcoming and good people to be around in that horse world. Mm. And, um, yeah, from then I actually applied for an internship here at Riata, uh, the Houlihan Ranch with Riata and Gabe. They'd sort of hit, uh, hit up a bit of a deal there with the internship, and I was the first person off the bandwagon, I think, out of about, I think it was about 500 people from memory, I don't know, but they can probably correct me on that, but there was there was only about five guys that, that entered into that sort of deal, and there was a lot of women, a lot of women. <laughs> anyway, so I ended up over here because I was the first guy, and I was pretty keen on it, and must have had a pretty good application, I don't know, well, they felt sorry for me, one or the other, <laughs> and I got into the deal over here, and um, there was myself and five gals, and yeah, we came over here for this cult start in 2019, we are here in June, and stayed through till July, and went back home and I always wanted to get back here and do a bit of roping and a bit of ranch work and just put what I had knowledge from this is all based around, you know, the bridal horse tradition and cattle work. So I was like, I've got to get around a bit more roping. So I've been sort of practising my horsemanship back home and just getting my horses gentler and kinder and one day I'll ride in my wade saddle with my, my McCarty, you know, just in the snaffle bit. And other days I'll ride in split reins and my Australian stock saddle. It just depends on the day and what I'm doing. But, yeah, it's pretty cool having... Mm -hmm that versatility where you can take that horsemanship anywhere in the world. Like to be a good horseman is like being a good musician. You just, your instrument doesn't change. It's just different areas you're playing. Yeah. And it's like a universal language they've spoken about it in that way where, you know, you can listen to music and appreciate um, oriental music from China or from any part of the world. You can appreciate that good music. Good horsemanship is just good horsemanship wherever you are. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So I'm, I'm kind of ignorant on um, the Australian stock saddle specifics. But what would be a reason that you would ride in your Aussie saddle versus a Wade saddle? Just so I don't get picked on, basically. Oh, really? <laughs> I don't have... Is it more not, comfortable or...? Yeah, no, it's, it's comfortable. Sure, yeah. shit, it's comfortable. But um, there's just... In, in certain areas, like if I'm camp drafting, I've got to ride in that traditional Australian... Okay. Yeah, yeah, that's a good gear. example. So I've got, to, I've got to ride... There's people over in Australia, a bloke in Western Australia by the name of Andrew Turnbull. Not a relation of mine, but he's got the same last name as me. 
um, he has been trying to get into the camp drafting scene riding in a hackamore. And they've really kicked up a stink about that because there's no really... There's no real description of the headdress on the horse, what they've got to wear, but he's been trying to say, why can't I ride in a hackamore? It's just like a halter. They're like, well, you can't ride in a halter. You've got to ride in a bridle, and you've got to ride in a snaffle because that's what everyone rides in. It's just tradition. Yeah. It's like hopping on a horse from the left side. Like, everyone hops on that near side. Why not hop on the, the off side? Yeah. Change it up a bit. I was speaking to a gal there today and said, you know, I threw, a, threw the saddle on the fence, actually, and it's kind of funny, this German gal, and I was helping her out. And she said, um, can you turn my saddle around? I said, why do you want to put it on from the near side? She's like, yeah, I, I looked at all the other saddles up the fence and they were all thrown on from the near side. And I said, oh, it's just weird. I just I just saw a video of Ray Hunt one time and he threw a saddle on from the offside. I don't know whether he was left-handed or what it was. He, he chucked that rig up from that, that offside of that horse and it got it balanced. I've heard Tom Donner talk a lot about that in his videos and stuff that I've read. Getting that horse balanced up both sides. And I always throw that saddle up from the offside. You just let your cinches down, especially on a colt. You don't have to walk around back yeah. and forth and muck around. You mm -hmm. just let those cinches down. You're already there. I mean, it's not much harder. You just got to practice it. Get stronger with your left arm, I guess. And you're not throwing all that that rigging and you know your rope and everything over their back. And I just find it just worked well for me. And she was like, oh, "I've never seen that. Never heard of it." And I'm like, "I don't know. Just something I picked up and thought it, thought it worked pretty well." Yeah, but yeah, no, you get a lot of those old Ray Hunt cult starting DVDs. Oh, I've got, I've got a bunch. I've got a bunch. It's like you yeah. were talking about that guy that that had his little method where he'd rope the horse and get on it bareback and stuff. Yeah. Again, I can appreciate that. That's great. But then you have to find someone that can teach you that. And that may not be something everybody can do, right? No, Maybe no. not hardly anybody. No, so it's right. it's good to find somebody that can actually teach you some actual skills mm -hmm. until you get some feel going yeah. on. But and that, that guy was um, unique in his own way because he started that. It's sort of like... Um, roping a horse by a foot, like who does that? Why would you? Why would you rope a horse by a foot unless you're trying to front leg it and pull it down? Mm. But you know, Ray and Tom started doing that deal years and years ago, and it just it's it's just a really good way of getting to that horse's mind. This guy, he yeah. just he had this horse in the yard that hadn't been or bucked people down, hadn't been ridden, was wild, and he just thought I'm just going to throw a rope on it and get it gentle enough where I can get up near it. And when he got up near it, he hopped on it. That's just his. He just started this method, and um, you know. It's the same deal here. If you've got a horse and a up on a string in your ranch and you want to, your boss man's got to pick one out and he'll hand rope it, same sort of deal, I guess. You get them picked out of that bunch or if you've got a colt in a round corral, if you can't get your hand on it, you've got one way of catching it. You can either run around there all day on foot and throw a last rope on it and get, get it facing up, I suppose, in a certain way. Just have that tangible connection with that horse. Yeah, it's just a lot of similarities. But, yeah, getting people to teach you those certain techniques is always very difficult wherever you are. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. And the modern technology just taking it to the next level, like that Buck Channel and all that stuff. You know, mm -hmm. I've been a fan of those DVDs and books as long as I can remember. You know, just sit there at the bunkhouse at the end of the day and just read books, watch DVDs, just replay, go and go ahead and practice, and then come back and revisit. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that's one of the worst things I hate to hear is people complaining about how things are. And yeah, there's problems, but we probably live in in the best time to live ever. Yeah, easily, hands yeah. down. There's plenty of problems, but I mean, look at that. You, you just flew up here. Yeah, been no, here wouldn't, three wouldn't times. We that. wouldn't know you. Mm. We're doing a podcast. You can look up anything. I, I had to look up three things to set up this equipment tonight. Right? <laughs> we go. could pull up a video of, you know, any of the things we talked about. It, it's, it's a really a good time. And when people start saying, "Oh, it's so expensive," or well, then, well, then you should be able to make some money. Then it's like any way you look at it, there is a bright side. Is, and yeah. you don't hear that a lot, especially in, in our world. People like to carry a little chip around with them. But yeah. it's, you should be happy. We live in a good time. That's it. So, so you've been – so this is your third trip here. What's different about America? What, what strikes you when you come up here and you're, like, here for a while? Well, the people that I've been around have been the ranching sort of community and the horsemanship community, so I'll speak on that. I won't comment on the city life. Um, but yeah, no, the, like it's, it's something, something that really sticks out here is how you can appreciate horses and horsemanship. Like you guys have a really good, like, especially people that I've been around these clinics sort of deals and everything else. There's, um, there's so much more appreciation for good horses here than in Australia. Like in Australia, I'm getting on a bit of a tangent here, which people probably mightn't appreciate in the ranching world. But anyway, <laughs> um, in Australia, we use a lot of mechanized tools. Like we use buggies, quad bikes, two wheelers for gathering cattle. Then we also um, use tables for branding our calves. We put them in the yards or corrals, as they're, you know, they're called yards in Australia, and we hop off our 
motorbikes, horses, whatever we gathered with, and we'll we'll go and work those cattle on foot. Just the way we've done it since I've been around anyway. So it's just traditional that we do it that way now. Whereas here, when I first came here, the first day of ranching I ever did with Gabe Clark over there at the Half Circle at just in Idaho over the border from Wyoming here, um, yeah, we, we, we went and gathered these cattle, got them into the corrals and then started using the horses to cut those cattle out and sort them up. And I was like, this is dang cool. I'd always dreamed of doing this, just never had the knowledge how to do it or people to, to people to do it with. You've got to have people on the same page. Everyone's going to be on the same page. And just in America, people just appreciate that, that level of horsemanship or, um, you know, your horses, your horses are part of that heritage, the West. And people just love their horse here so much more than in Australia. Like, people do love horses in Australia, don't get me wrong, but they're just a tool. Yeah. There, mm. are, people, there are people who love them, but most of the time it's just a tool. And um, I'm sure in America there's probably similar similarities in that sort of deal. But, um, yeah, and the other thing I really like is that ranching vibe and that community. Like, you guys, it's it's a slow way of life. You might make so much cash flow or money in a certain, in a certain, certain way, but, um, you know... You just you just take it easy. You just poke along, do your chores for the day, do your job. Some days are big days, some days are, are smaller days where you might go and start a cult or muck around with some weanlings or braid a riata or whatever. You know, you've got plenty of things to do on a ranch, plenty of jobs to do. Um, but yeah, just that slow way of life is what suits me and what I enjoy. I'm attracted to in the Americas um, is that slow way of life, that camaraderie with other people on ranches, getting around brandings. This last one I've just done this last week, the AW has been just amazing. The camaraderie there. Um, yeah, you know, it's just, it's just really cool. And that, that, that aspiration to be better horsemen and better stockmen with mm. the stock. Like you look after your horses and then when you work in cattle, that's the end goal is to work cattle in my world. You want to look after those cattle. You don't yep. want to just treat them like they're a tool or they're just, you know, yeah, you don't want to treat them like that. You won't be invited back for the next branding. You won't be, you won't be, you won't yeah. talk about as a good person around the campfire at the end of the day. Absolutely. Mm. Now I wonder, I mean, I don't want to knock on Australians or anything, but, um, just it's bred into our culture to really value efficiency. Yeah. You know, and, and I, I can't speak for our government, but for individuals, you know, we have that personal sovereignty. So we really value making things efficient and also trying to enjoy our day. And that, you know, that breeds efficiency and, and beauty and makes things smooth and, and nice. And I don't know if maybe Australians, just because of, just the cultural founding of that continent or just things being different. Just, it was a different mindset for a long time to where maybe that's a little more on the back burner. Or, I mean, I'm sure you could speak to that more. Yeah. So your question is just about efficiency in the, in the agricultural world. Yeah. Just, yeah. Like the mindset towards the same thing you were just saying about American ranchers. Mm. How would you say the mindset is in Australia and why do you think that is? Well, I'm only 31, so I can't comment too far back. But in in my era, <laughs> I've you seen live a lot there. Of, I've seen I'll a lot. sit here and speculate. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's <laughs> it. But like, yeah, like, um, yeah, it's funny. Different areas of Australia, they and different people. It's all about the people. Like, if people hold that heritage in high regard, then they'll they'll be like old fashioned ranchers. They'll have their horses. They'll have their dogs. They'll do things the old fashioned way. Like, I've grown up in an era when I was in school. I I just I was sort of I don't know if I'm lucky or not with the with the phones, but I was lucky enough to have a phone when I was in school, in high school and that. And then um as time's gone on, like we've got these iPhones now we're up to whatever we are, sixteen or fifteen, where we just they just keep pumping them out. And like it's great, you can sit out there in the middle of the field and have internet reception, talk on Facebook or YouTube or whatever with your friends and buddies and whatnot. And there's just all this technology that's going through the young people nowadays, I don't know whether it's a, a scourge or a curse or a good thing or a bad thing, I don't know, but I think it's, it's it, it goes against that old ranching tradition, you know what I mean? And um, the people that I get around in my sort of neck of the woods, we're, we try and utilise that technology, but we always want to go back towards those more traditional things, like, you know, being good people, looking after your livestock, doing your job, you know. I just It's, it's funny to me how people can make money now being influences on Instagram and TikTok and all this sort of jazz. I just I just can't get it. I couldn't think of anything worse in my world. But yeah, I'm, <laughs> pretty I'm pretty good living at that. I'm 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 very traditional. I just I just want a piece of land, house, couple of dogs, horses, cattle, just do my thing. Can survive off minimal income. Be good to be a millionaire, but 
you know, money's not the be all and end all in my world and people that I'm around. You know, being happy and having a good, enjoyable job is is yeah. what it's about, and that's what you know, real horsemanship and stockmanship is to me is just getting out there and enjoying that day. And yeah. You just you know, you, you're looking after your livestock and you're doing something for the better good in the world. You know, you're producing food. Mm-hmm. There's no nobler cause for a man or a woman um, than producing food for the world. You know. Yeah. It's yeah. I think the, you can take stock of what what you can impact personally, and then be a good steward of it mm, in the sure. best way you can. Because, I mean, at the same time, you know, it is nice to have a simple life, but then we also wouldn't be sitting here in the in America if it wasn't for guys who gave up all that yeah. to fight for this, mm-hmm. right? So everybody kind of has their part once you realize what, what life is for you, and maybe you'll find out mm-hmm. as life goes on what that is. You just try to be responsible with that responsibility that you've been given. But yeah, definitely the phones are awesome. I think it's just kind of a, it's like a tool that we don't quite have bridled in. It's like a great <laughs> tool. And then you can also use it as a great, like oh, total yeah. mind numbing entertainment device. No doubt. Yeah. yeah no, it, it sure can be a blessing and a curse at the same time. Sometimes. Absolutely. The, the, well, the, like what he just said, um, something that kind of switched for me when I got around this whole like horsemanship stockmanship deal, um, like growing up, it was like, yeah, the cattle, the cattle are like the job and it's like, let's just get this done and then we can like go enjoy our lives. Right. And then it was like a complete 180 where it's like, Hey, you know, like, like living on the land, like working with these animals, it can be enjoyable. It like, you don't have to look at it like a nine to five, Mm -hmm. which I feel like, you know, you were talking about like table branding and like stuff like that, which that stuff happens in the U S too. Like people have that. Um, I, I feel like mechanized stuff like that and that perspective go hand in hand. Right. It's like, how quickly can we get this done? And then we can like knock off and go have a pint or something like that. Right. Where if you're just really enjoying the stockmanship or the horsemanship, it's like, Hey, like, like you're doing this because supposedly you like being around animals and stuff. It's like take the extra time to be around animals and do it mm. the right way or yeah. whatever you want to say. So what you just said there, like that was kind of a big perspective shift for me a couple of years ago when I started looking at like, Hey, yeah, maybe if like it takes an extra half hour to gather this pasture mm. and like get everything into where like, you know, everything's mothered up nothing gets into a trot and we just like everything walks and the pins really calm. It's like, yeah, maybe it takes a little bit extra time, but like, don't you, didn't you say you like riding your horse? Don't you say you like working cattle? It's like, yeah, it'll take extra time, but like, what are you going to do? Like trade this for like half an hour on Facebook? Yeah, no, that's right. And that's the thing. That's what I enjoy about being in the bush in Australia. You know, you can take that time, you can enjoy your day, you look around and like, when I was riding in the Northern Territory in Australia, I just I used to just ride that horse along the wing of a mob of, you know, a thousand head of cattle. And you just look around, you're like, oh, a bit saddle sore, a bit boring, you know, nothing really exciting's happened today. And you look around, you're like, you know, I should really be, I should really think about how blessed I am in my life. You know, I get some beautiful <laughs> country ride through, a good horse between my legs, cattle to follow, you know, yeah, a job. You know, it's, it's just it's that perspective of livelihood and what you want to get out of life. Like, you know, yeah. as you've said, you know, you can go a little bit slower and sacrifice that bit of efficiency for so much more joy in your day. Mm-hmm. And that's why I don't live in the city and work in the city because it's all that hustle bustle, getting in nine to five, get that job done. It's every minute, every second, every, you know, all that work just to rush home and do something else. If, yeah. you're, if you're living on a ranch, you sort of don't rush to get anywhere else. You sort of want to be on that ranch and make it all work. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. But I haven't met many horses, cattle, or dogs, or any, any animals that wear watches. We're the only people that wear watches that I know. Yeah, yeah. And the guy, <laughs> I I remember I was riding in Oklahoma with a guy we've had on the podcast, uh, Derek Chapelier. Mm. He, oh my gosh! So he like manages like th- this like half of a ranch, right? A pretty big ranch in Oklahoma, and like I'd go out and help him. He's like be be ready to ride out at seven and we'll go do our deal. We'll check heifers, yada, yada. And we'll be out there. And this man like doesn't even carry his phone with him mm. to go out and do this. And like, it, it 
gave me, I was like, dude, what if your like boss calls you? What if your wife calls you? What if, like, what? and he's like, you know, like I have my phone on, you know, he gets done. He was calving out heifers at the time. He yeah. gets done maybe around 10, maybe around 11, depending on how many calves there are. And, you know, just depends on what happens. He's like, he's like, this is a job where I don't want to have any distractions. I don't want to know what time it is. I just want to do the job right. And I just do that. And then I get back and then I'll look at my phone and then I'll figure out how much more time I have left in the day. He's like, but I got to make sure these heifers are calving out. So the first like four or five hours of the day, I just ride through the whole pasture, check everything and do this. He's like, cause every, all the cool stuff for me that has happened with horses, dogs and cattle, it's all happened when there's no time frame mm. for making it happen. But it, it was wild to me, like, going out there. I'm like, oh, you got your phone? Like, we need to do this. Like, what time is it? I don't know what time it is. I don't have my phone. No one can get a hold of me. I was like, dude, you're a madman. <laughs> like, you're responsible for so much, and you don't yeah. have your phone on you right yeah. now? Wow. Yeah. But he was like, nope, not going to do it. So. That makes sense. So, I mean, if that is your job, then what do you need your phone? It's not like you have something else going on that day. Yeah. yeah. Well, like for me, I'm the opposite, man. Like the yeah. biggest high I ever get is when I meet a deadline. Yeah. That's my favorite thing in the world oh, right. is to you like get that stack dopamine, up a bunch right? of things yeah. and be like, ah, it's noontime. <laughs> you're like, I did five things and I finished on time. Mm -hmm. But like, that's what I'm trying to do. But I, yeah. but like if we're here at the clinic, like I didn't have my phone all day. Yeah. Because yeah. nice. that's what we're doing. We're doing that. Mm. I didn't need to call anybody. No. And if someone called you, you wouldn't be answering your phone anyway. No, I wouldn't. You'd be getting kicked out of that ring. So I totally get It's like you prioritize what are you trying to do mm -hmm. and then set up your life to match that. Yeah. If you're calving out heifers, why do you have, like, what? You yeah. You need a time schedule? No. Yeah. It's like you have a day. Yeah. God gave you a day. Go calve heifers. I mean, t yeah, and talk about and you can intentional. be intentional. Like, you know how intentional you are when you ride out with no phone and yeah. you're like, I'm yeah. just going to, like, just you don't need to worry about it. Yeah. But it's, that's as intentional like as so hitting the five deadlines before noon. Because, yeah. like, that's what you needed to do. Well, yeah. if you need to calve heifers, that's how you need to do it to get that done. Yeah. So there's some rationale to it. Makes no, sense. no, I, I agree. But yeah. I, it impressed me because, I mean, can you imagine, like I said, being responsible for all that, mm. having a guy who's your boss, um, having a wife at home because his wife's at home like riding outside horses and doing stuff by herself right so just imagine see and like i'm not trying to like rip on Derek. i think it's a cool thing but i was i was really impressed i was like man this guy is like talk about being where your feet are right <laughs> like i think about that a lot trying to be better about that like being where my feet are not trying to like plan 20 steps ahead or three hours ahead just like no, just do this thing right now, and then we'll go to the next thing and next thing. It's like, man, that guy's the epitome of that. If you can just, like, I don't even have my phone. We're just going to calve heifers. Going to get it all done. Yeah. And and that kind of circles back to what we were talking about. It's like, yeah, you say you enjoy doing this. Like, put your money where your mouth is, put your phone down, and go enjoy doing that and do it the right way. Yeah, absolutely. Well, same with horsemanship. It's like when you see someone trying to, I mean, we all screw up, but when you really see someone who who consistently tries to rush things and don't have any time to just wait, mm -hmm. like maybe they don't really enjoy doing it. It's like when the farrier's out in the barn beating the horse. You're like, <laughs> I think he's probably doing this for money, that one. you know. I remember when I was a kid, we used to help this farrier, and we went to this barn one time because uh, he was taking over for the old farrier, and that horse was so beat, you know, and the lady was, you know, like you, it's stuff like that. People are just in the wrong job sometimes, and... Just got to be honest with yourself, and and maybe you have an anger problem too. But yeah, it uh, it happens. Yeah, it's just a but, way of way of life. I think, like you know, yeah. you, if you're in the ranching sort of game, you know, that's just the way it is, and that's the way it's been done. Well, phones have only been around for what 50, 60 years, I suppose, or whatever. You know, the, the telephones have been around for a little while, but mobile phones definitely have been around that long. So it's it's a very recent technology. And what you were saying there before, Joe, about um, you know, carrying your mobile. It's kind of funny because back on the ranch back home, I'll, I'll carry my mobile just about everywhere just because of that safety aspect where if something happens, I've always got that, mm -hmm. that phone I can call someone because we've got a pretty good reception where we are. But um, I get caught into the mindset like I'm out stripping wieners off cows and I'll be um, tailing those wieners out and feeding them out in pasture and um, just working the dogs and horses and I'll just be sitting there thinking, geez, it's a, 
this paints a really pretty picture and there'll be a nice sunset in the background, a bit of dust and everything. It looks pretty cool. I'm like, just want to whip out my phone, get a bit of an Instagram reel here. And go yeah. on. You know, you, you, get, go. you get some good photos and stuff and it's pretty cool. Just being out, like your grandparents wouldn't do that. They would have seen the same things back when they would, like when they were doing yeah. it. Like, you know, you, you think about all those, those people that have gone through that and they've, they've not had that technology. It can be a real blessing and a real curse. It exactly. really can be, but I just, I just try and use it for, you know, use it for good and mm-hmm. get the best out of it that I can. And yeah, yeah you know, well, I mean, I, that's I, kind of this podcast, right? Oh, it's is, for sure. Like, this is like what it is, you know. 20 years ago, like, not, the not same the, yeah, the same type of people pursuing horsemanship existed, but, like, this platform didn't exist. No, so, for sure. Um, and, and, I mean, like, in terms of that, like, agrarian horsemanship, Western lifestyle, whatever you want to call it, like, gosh, like, Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, like, that has, like been part along with you know yellowstone and that whole deal it's been a part of like the revival like it's cool to be a cowboy again because yeah. finally like they've always been cowboys but finally you know someone like a dusty person can like have an instagram story where he's on the four sixes like doing all kinds of crazy stuff you know and people are like oh that's cool i want to be like that guy yeah where that didn't exist 15 20 years ago yeah. so yeah, it's, it's really a main artery of the of the industry yeah, a hundred percent. Yeah, hundred percent. A lot of horse, a lot of people that ride horses for the public wouldn't have a business without Facebook. Yeah, that I do. Right, that's that's me entirely. If I, if I and if, then they're hating on Mark Zuckerberg at the same time. Yeah, <laughs> but yeah. Jay, if we didn't have this podcast and I didn't ride horses for the public, I would probably ditch social media yeah. entirely because I know it like is not a benefit to my life outside of those two things. We'd probably read more books. Probably. Probably, I'd probably be a lot smarter than we are right now. Drink more beer for sure. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> well, yeah, because you wouldn't yeah. see those videos about quitting drinking. Yeah. But it just goes to show everything in moderation can be beneficial. Mm. Yeah. Including time. And uh, I don't know if you had anything else. But I, I think so we I ought got, to wrap up fairly soon. I, I think so too. So I've that's got, like the first ding. I've got one more. And we'll go for another 35 minutes. Question. Sure. <laughs> yeah. I mean, hell, I got more beer in the truck. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, so so you were talking about like your goals and all this stuff and and it sounds like recently you've become the manager of the place you're working at. Um I'm curious what what are your like personal horsemanship goals going forward and um when you like as as you're managing this place are you keeping any of that in mind like for example say like if you go to hire someone, if if that's part of your role, do you take into account like does horsemanship matter? Like for example, back at our place in Virginia, um, we've be, because I'm kind of gotten into this world and ride for the public and everything like that. It's gotten to be where now we kind of work cattle almost a different way, mm-hmm. right? Because I like the people that work there and it's important to me that they value not only the horsemanship, but like the stockmanship that comes with it. Mm. So it's like, yeah, if, you know, if I ever run that place one day, that will be really important to me is how, how are the stock handled? And do you care about how the stock are handled? Because I've been places where people don't give a crap about like they're just like we'll get the things in the freaking pin and then we'll do whatever we need to do and they'll do it by any means necessary right um and they don't eat and even if on, they're on horseback i don't like i don't care what the horse does i don't care if his head's going up or like i'll tie that down and i'll do all, like i've been places where that's happened too so um yeah i'm just curious about like your goals on where you'd like to take this and if it's going to to hopefully impact your everyday life or if it's just kind of like a separate thing because of the nature of the beast or like how do you see it i'm kind of curious about that yeah well, that's a, that's a really good question um from w- my perspective on the horsemanship deal i just it was just a, a hobby sort of that tied in with my life being on a ranch and having horses so i just thought it was pretty cool just like knowing more about horsemanship and how to get one working under you know underneath you in your hands and whatever um but now <clears throat> being on a property and you know managing this ranch that i'm on and trying to you know make ends meet and make money and profit for the shareholders of the company and whatever else um 
it it really is important to me the people I hire because I do hire and um, get the staff sort of sorted out with the stock work and everything and run that sort of crew. Um, I yeah, I, I definitely try and find people who have an an aspiration to work stock better, mm-hmm. and then that ties in with horsemanship. If they want to learn how to work stock better, usually they understand stock better. Usually they know how to work a horse or a dog or they know something, some sort of X factor they've got going over the other people that are applying for that job. But like, you know, I do hire people who are just backpackers that are straight out off the ship from wherever they've come from and they've got no experience. Like I've I've worked with some cattle before. I'm like, what experience you got? They're like some dairy cows. I'm like, well that's not gonna help you in the middle of Queensland. But <laughs> it's better than nothing, you know, and these people yeah. are like I've worked with some sheep. I had five head of sheep I had to, you know, pick up and throw over a fence once, you know. It's, it, it's just the way, the nature of the beast sort of deal. And, you know, there is there is people, the bosses sometimes don't care for the stock and there's sometimes workers don't care for the stock. But I try and really run a good tight ship where, you know, we care about our livestock, we care about efficiency, we care about getting the job done, but also care about the horsemanship and, and making ourselves better horsemen on the, on the ranch. Care about those cattle and keeping them in good frames of mind where, you know, you work them so that you can be efficient, but also they're going to be efficient next time you handle them. Because if you just rush through, you know they're going to get worse every time you handle them. Yeah. So you take that time to mother those cattle up, to walk them in slow, to block them up here and there. And there's certain things you do in that role that you make things better for the next time round um, and try not to rush. So, yeah, I really hold that that dear to my heart, like and especially in the back of my mind every second of every day, that horsemanship, that stockmanship, all that sort of deal. And the people I hire... Um, whether they stay on the ranch long enough or not, it depends on how they work and how they can how they aspire for what they do. Because I try and pe- I try and hire people that are going to last, mm-hmm. and I hire people on what I can see them going for in the future. As far as me with my horsemanship deal, like you know, I'd love to, I'd love to compete in a, f- a few you know local camp drafts in Australia. Maybe do uh, if there's a roping over there, I'd love to get down some ropings, um, some uh, cow horse work. You know, just do some competitions just to test. It's more so not so much about winning, winning the ribbon for me. It's more so about testing my horses and myself. You know, you can ride back home and I've got that, that young stud of mine. He's only six year old and he's the coolest dude. I just love riding him at home. He's just he's just perfect. Like couldn't put a foot wrong. When you get to a local show and there's a couple of fillies in heat there, he starts acting up a little bit, sort of getting a bit bossy and doing some things that I don't really appreciate much for. And, you know... It's just the nature of that sort of beast and the way things work, and you know you've got to, and that's what really tests that horse out and tests me out and my horsemanship skills, and you know it just it's just a good test. And if you don't, if you think you're the, the biggest fish in a, in the pond, go and jump in a bigger pond and see how big you really are. You know you've got yeah. to get around, and that's why I love coming to these sort of deals, especially in the states where I'm meeting some phenomenal horsemen pe- people here, that'll um and and stockmen and everything just. Just talking with, I do a bit of rawhide braid and talking with braiders, makers um, about different things and what they do. Just they just inspire me, and that's what I'm all about in my journey in life at the moment. Is just inspiration and where I'm going towards. I don't really have an end goal in mind of like being the best hand at roping in Australia, or whatever it is. I just want to become a better horseman, a better person in general. And um, for me, it's always just pursuing that light at the end, at the end of the tunnel that you're never going to catch. But it's all about that journey. So it's always just progressing and getting better and better and better with the horses, with the livestock, with everything. Just And even with people. Like, you know, we were talking there before about, you know, on the ranch, making money, whatever else. The people are important too. Like, I've got some kids that come in under me, and I'm not very old, I'm only 31, but you get some kids coming in, they're only 18, 19, and you've got to train them up and set them on the right path. You know, you've got to set yeah. a good example for those young people coming through, and you, you can make or break a young person. You can sour them on a deal. So, you know, you've got to, like a young colt, you've got to take it slow and make sure you make, the, make things positive, give them confidence, do the right thing to set them on the right journey because, you, you know, you'll influence them going through their life as well. So there's a whole circle of sort of things that can come into that. But, yeah, I don't really have a, a, a set goal for my horsemanship. No, it's just getting better and maybe one day someone might say my hand with a horse or something like that might call me a horseman. I don't know, but I just, I just aspire to be better every day. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, can't beat that. Amen. I I think that's a good place to wrap up, don't you? That's perfect. Yeah. Well, Chris, it's good to see like you. Today. Thanks it's for doing perfect. this. We've been wanting to do this for a while, but I'm glad we got to do it in person. Yeah. Yeah, you bet. Works a lot better. And the ambiance. I mean, you know, you know, yeah. can't find a better set than this. <laughs> cool hand ranch. With our igloo and all that. Yeah, all the setup. You right, bet. Thank you. You guys have been amazing. Yeah, all right. Yeah, we'll have fine. a good day tomorrow. We will.
we will. Three more good days. We'll see if I get bucked off. Yeah, we're going to get our cameras <laughs> out for sure that. Not. We'll check on how Roger's doing. You the got morning. the best chance of that. I mean, because <laughs> of your horse, not because of you. But yeah. Hey. They hey, know what made, I'm saying. We made some good progress tonight. No, and, you look uh, good. There's a, you guys, dude. there's a good. Well, you're up there watching. He's yeah, getting yeah, better. Yeah, I saw a bit. But. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to hit him in the morning again before we start. I'm, yeah, I'm, <laughs> I'm a little paranoid about this yeah, guy. Yeah. yeah. All right, anyway, let's get out of here. We'll be good. All right, Got see you, everybody. All right, now we don't really have to go anywhere. Yeah, we're going to stay here.